Well, good morning. Um, I'd like to thank the Atlantic Council for inviting me uh, to take part in this symposium. It's always nice for me to return to the University of Toronto, and uh, every time I walk by the Robarts Library, I seem to go on automatic pilot for some reason, having spent a good part of my life in that building. I wanted first I want first to start with a few reminders of what NORAD is. NORAD, of course, is the brand name in Canada-U.S. defense relations. And because it's such a totemic institution, very often people don't really know what NORAD is. So I just wanted to give a few little reminders. One of the things that's really interesting about NORAD is it really is a unique binational partnership between two sovereign nations, a large one and a medium-sized one. And as such, the commander of NORAD, right now General Charles Jacoby of the United States Army, is responsible to both Canada and the United States. The commander reports to uh, the Chief of the Defense Staff and the Minister of National Defense. And he takes his Canadian responsibilities very, very seriously. NORAD, of course, has evolved over the years, and this is one of the things why it's still that brand name in Canada-U.S. relations. We all know that it started back in the worst days of the Cold War uh, with the uh, Soviet bomber threat, and there's one of our friends, uh, Bear H., uh, still one of our friends from time to time. In the 60s and 70s, the, the threat shifted to intercontinental ballistic missiles. In the 80s, cruise missiles, and the Switch to cruise missiles was one of the driving factors in the uh, North Warning System that Dr. Lockenbauer mentioned earlier. In, 19, in the 1990s, the missions really solidified around aerospace warning and aerospace control. And of course, after 2001, the asymmetric threat, we know that's still a threat from what we learn. Uh, various people are still uh, committed to using civil aviation against North America. A lot of good work is being done every day to prevent that. In 2006, the Maritime Warning Mission was added to the treaty. And, well, who knows where NORAD will go. It has its great adaptability, and uh, it's really impossible at this moment to say where it will go. Um, there are other areas out there that are pretty serious that we talk about all the time, such as the cyber threat. Anyway, moving on, in the 2006 agreement, maritime was added, maritime warning was added, and you might ask why, did NORAD need something extra to do because other things were getting too quiet? Well, I think it really became obvious to a lot of people when we started to talk about the asymmetric threat, that aviation was one aspect of it, but what about all the ports of North America, and all the incredible variety of shipping that frequents those ports. And it was one of our previous commanders, uh, Admiral Keating, I think, who probably first started thinking about adding maritime warning to the NORAD mission set. Now, obviously, this was a new area, and it took some time to come up with even the terms of reference. The agreement is actually fairly compact, if you've read it. And it's the terms of reference that we articulate the agreement for those who have to implement it. So put the terms of reference up there about processing, assessing, disseminating intelligence in, and information related to the maritime areas, internal waterways, and maritime approaches in North America. That's kind of obvious. The next is to warn of maritime threats to North America or attacks against North America. Now, we've been talking a lot about just Jayada South and uh, other kinds of law enforcement problems that are threats to North America. But we also still have to consider that there is a peer competitor out there, which is a nuclear power. And while it might seem strange in this day and age, the equations of deterrence still have to be maintained. And NORAD with its basic role in the defense side of giving unambiguous warning of attack on North America, that strategic mission is still very important to the overall strategic stability between the two great nuclear powers. 
That's why we go up and look after those bears when they come. And that's why we talk about attacks against North America from the maritime side. Uh, our Russian friends have a very capable land attack, sea launch cruise missile. And once it's launched, it's an air breather, and that's a NORAD air defense responsibility. So we cover the spectrum from uh, what could be human, human trafficking, drug trafficking, through potential attack by the pure military competitor. Granted, the last is not something that we expect to happen tomorrow, but it's part of the stability equation between the two great nuclear powers. Third thing is to create mutual support arrangements with other commands and agencies. That's, of course, much easier said than done. That's a process that I'll get into a little later, but it takes a lot of patient, patient diplomacy. I once, uh, a couple of years ago, went to a Maritime Stakeholders Conference in Baltimore, and the room was full of all kinds of people from every kind of agency you could imagine that had anything to do with the sea or ports. Well, I'm sure you're all aware and familiar with the expression, herding cats. <laughs> This was the absolutely perfect example of herding cats because everybody was going in slightly different directions. And I give an awful lot of credit to the people that will work in my building and to commanders of NORAD that the cats have actually started to go pretty much in the same direction. It's been a lot of very patient, you can imagine, interagency diplomacy. So I think we, we've come to a pretty good place there. So the next thing is developing this comprehensive shared understanding of maritime activities in order to better identify maritime threats. That's a, that's a simple phrase for actually what to non-maritime people seems simple, but to maritime people is an enormous task. You only have to sort of consider the number of ports in North America, and the number of cargoes of all kinds that come into these ports. It's not just big container ships that are coming into Halifax or New Jersey or Los Angeles. There are all kinds of tankers with potentially hazardous threats, toxic materials, anhydrous ammonia, LPG. Um, there's a tremendous number of small ships that come in and out of the port. Some of them very small, some of them go fast, some of them perfectly innocent looking small freighters. And of course, most of them are perfectly innocent. So developing that comprehensive understanding and bringing it together in NORAD has been a big part of the mission. And it shall be the surveillance and control are not NORAD missions. This is part of the deal with all our partners. We are not trying to take unto ourselves what we do in the aerospace side which is aerospace control. That is a national mission, and that is left to the Royal Canadian Navy, the United States Navy, and our two Coast Guards, and the law enforcement authorities that work with them as necessary. And even the surveillance assets are national assets, not NORAD assets. NORAD, of course, has the North Warning System and can tap into other systems, but we own none of these when it comes to the Maritime Warning Mission but we're a customer for them all. One of the things that's interesting about the NORAD missions is that they're really global. Uh, we are in the business of defending North America, and I would say we probably are the perfect articulation of Prime Minister King and President Roosevelt's vision. But the area of operations is global. When a maritime threat emerges, it can be on the other side of the world. And of course, when aerospace threats emerge, they can come from any different direction, especially if they're of the asymmetrical kind. So that's the way it sort of looks most of the time in NORAD. This is an interesting slide, the next one as well, because dissecting what this challenge really is is kind of complicated. You have to sort of conceptualize it in time and distance factors. When you start to talk about detection and analysis and information sharing, what level of awareness do you need? If you're just talking about data points, there's an infinity of data out there. 
that <coughs> when you, if you don't process it, it's just confusion. So what, what level are you, are you attempting to attain? You can't have perfect knowledge of everything. So what do you need to get that warning? And you have to have the warning in a timely sense if you're actually going to do anything about it. So when does surveillance and analysis start? Well, a lot of it starts with, you can look on the, on, the, on the slide, friendly government intelligence agencies in all parts of the world. We have intelligence partners everywhere. And they help us on these things. They advise us and we take that information. We have to have what commanders call decision advantage, that we are making the decisions and we are not being driven by the adversary's decision. That's easier said than done. And then all kinds of connections. There's not just intelligence agencies that are out there. The, the maritime industry is a huge private sector business. And lots of very valuable information comes from the captains of ports from shipping agencies, from shipping lines, from individual crews, individual crew persons. So you have to bring all that governmental and private sector information into the funnel. And of course we have to have good mutual support agreements to make, make sure that the information is in the right place at the right time. A little diagram here about time and space. Obviously, in the aerospace dimension, time and space shrinks very, very rapidly. But I think it's probably underestimated by most of us land people that time and space can shrink very rapidly in the maritime domain as well, faster than we might think. Of course, you start with the surveillance and intelligence away, away. It could be in Southeast Asia, it could be Africa, it could be somewhere in our own hemisphere. And then there's that period where you have the luxury of assessing this intelligence, perhaps bringing more surveillance to bear on something that looks interesting. And then, of course, there's that period of coordination where all the agencies have to work together. And there are two processes that we call motor and merc. I always forget what they mean, so I spelled them out. Motor is the United States Maritime Operational Threat Response Process, and merc is the Canadian Maritime Event Response Protocol. They're not quite the same in operation, but they sort of come to the same point where this is when uh, the authorities and navies and coast guards and intelligence agencies decide how they're actually going to work together to deal with the issue. And then, of course, you have to get your forces in position, and that's, you're starting to get closer to the homeland, and you have to provide that assessment and make that decision in time to get the response forces, which must be underway by the time the threat is actually getting to this artificial line on the map. And then, of course, you want to have a minimum intercept point. You don't want something that's too dangerous if it is uh, a terrorist device in a container ship or someone wanting to blow up uh, a chlorine tanker in a harbor. You don't want them to get too close. You want to be able to engage them quite a distance out from our own shores. And then, of course, there's the last line where you must have them or else that, that threat will actually enter into the port and cause all kinds of disaster. And when we're talking about things like chlorine, uh, anhydrous ammonia, these are, of course, the common industrial chemicals and elements of, of our world. But some of them are incredibly dangerous. Now the process is interesting. We like to talk about it as one of those hourglasses lying on its side. And of course there's the collection business. And that's all these people that I was mentioning. Intelligence agencies, the private sector, other government departments, etc. around the world. NORAD gets involved in this part in the middle. And that's where we try and make a comprehensive understanding of what could be the threat assessing what is the nature of it, what has to be done. And then NORAD issues a maritime warning or an advisory. These are not issued very often. They go to all the stakeholders. And so it's important, going back if you think of the Pacific Coast, 
the people in Portland get the same sort of advisory that the people in Vancouver get, even though we might think that that vessel is going to British Columbia. Of course, Portland's not far away. And so it's, it's very useful for the U.S. Coast Guard, the Harbor Master, the law enforcement authorities as required to know that that is out there. And if the response is such that it diverts the target of interest, well, they're ready. And this is proven, you might say, well, so what? Everybody knows this sort of thing. But in fact, when we've issued these things, the feedback that NORAD gets from various partners is that this little bit of information is actually very valuable. It's very reassuring to people who are in the area, seemingly unrelated. And then, as I mentioned, response is a national prerogative. And of course, the Canadian Navy and the American Navy have been working together since about sometime after the War of 1812. And the Coast Guards work very well together. And so that's not something that NORAD gets involved with for the simple reason that these channels of communication, operational uh, compatibility are so well established. It's not necessary for NORAD to get involved in that as we would if it was you know, looking after a terrorist aircraft. NORAD does not have any resources for that. We hand that over to our maritime partners. Some of the things that we're doing right now in order to improve NORAD commanders' awareness, this is an ongoing process. So I just thought I'd go through a couple of the things that we're doing right now. Uh, military people, of course, are very familiar with the critical information requirement terminology. And this is something, of course, that commanders have to have because it triggers their response to certain things. And it's, it's progressive, it intensifies, but it's a way of sorting out information and not bothering the command structure with things that are not important. So we're trying to develop a binational maritime critical information requirement list. This is something that takes a lot of work. It has to be agreed if we're going to make the motor and MERP processes work more effectively together. They don't have to be exactly the same. We're not saying that Canada has to sign up to precisely the US system. They have to be broadly compatible. And so getting that critical information requirement list right between the two countries is important for both these processes. And NORAD needs to be a partner, not necessarily a front seat partner in these processes, but in the room, part of the club. And to ensure that everyone is thinking along the same lines. I think the interagency uh, thought process and cultural development in both countries is very well advanced. I've been myself to the uh, Marine Security Operations Center in Halifax a couple of times with for two commanders. And it's very impressive to see how the Navy, the Coast Guard, the RCMP, Transport Canada all work together in the same room, sharing information, and very careful to keep law enforcement information separate from you know, ordinary alert information, because that's essential if you ever take someone to court and lay charges. The third thing is a secure binational collaboration procedure. Uh, of course, when we deal in the classical NORAD missions, a lot of this goes through secure communications channels for obvious reasons. One of the things that's difficult in the maritime side is a lot of the partners are not set up for secure communications, which is a very expensive business once you get into it. So what we have to sort out is a process that works when it's necessary, but does not freeze other people out of that loop when they have to know certain things. This is a real challenge. It, it involves legal questions, it involves bilateral, binational legal questions, and sharing of information, of course, as anybody who's ever worked in these areas know, is one of the great issues. It needs a lot of basic human cooperation. But you need a process as well as goodwill, and that's one thing that's being worked right now. And then you come right down to the old headquarters staff and interagency information sharing on a daily basis. The culture of need to share versus need to keep it really close, really close hold. And most agencies 
international cultures naturally tend to be that way. We want to keep it close. But the need to share is the dominant culture nowadays in NORAD and increasingly throughout this community that I've been speaking to. Well, when I was being interviewed by a previous commander for my job, this was the examination they gave me down in Colorado Springs. Not really. Um, I could probably get about 85% on that. Um, there are a lot of stakeholders in this business. And they are sometimes purely national, red and blue. They are binational, such as NORAD. They're bilateral, such as NORTHCOM, CanadaCom. <coughs> There are all kinds of different departments of government, ranging from our border services agency, Transport Canada to the Department of Transport. And what's interesting are the links that go around way outside of North America. You can see UCOM, that's United States European Command, CENTCOM, United States Central Command, NATO, Pacific Command, and as I mentioned, a lot of those partners that don't show up intelligence partners around the world that sometimes give us our initial cueing that something is going wrong someplace. So that is uh, illustrative, but I think it also shows the complexity of the institutional world in which we're dealing. And while lots of places have institutional complexities, I think the maritime domain is probably one of the most complex anywhere in the world. For example, when we're dealing with aerospace issues. It's, it's the NORAD assets, and it's the Canadian and American Air Force radar assets and our fighter fleets. And we work, of course, very closely with the Federal Aviation Administration and NAV Canada, and a few others. Nothing in comparison to sheer number and complexity to our partners in the maritime area. So I'll stop there you with the last thought about NORAD, partners in defense for 54 years, still going strong. Thank you very much.